So um, I'm going to let Joseph talk about some DNS, DCHP um, issues and um, best practices. So Joseph, you want to try turning, unmuting yourself and sharing your screen? Yep. Okay. Hello, I'm Joseph Meyer. I'm from Brody and Schwartz. It's a German Unique-based company. Um, I'm uh, working with OKD um, since more than three years now. We started with OKD 3.10 and uh, yeah, um, moved the road over um, OKD 3.11 to OKD 4. Currently we are um, there. Um, OKD helped us a lot in, yeah, my company a lot in um, getting in touch with Kubernetes and gaining the skills for that because Kubernetes, vanilla Kubernetes is not um, yeah, an easy, easy thing. And uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we used OKD to learn that all. And now we are in a stage where we move parts of our um, Kubernetes clusters to OpenShift um, for having more production loads and getting the support from Red Hat um, yeah, and now I try to show you a little bit about my first or <laughs> what I thought are the, the heaviest steps in the beginning. Um, if you start with um, user provisioned infrastructure and with DNS, DHCP and an external load balancer. Um, <clears throat> can you see my, my screen share? I hope so. Yep. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. Um, this is a diagram of my home lab I'm running here um, at home. I'm using, uh, I'm using uh, VMware vSphere. I bought a license um, for that's very suitable for home lab users. It's it costs um, around 150 bucks. It's called um, VMware User Group Advantage Edition. Um, you have to pay 150 euros for a one year license. I think that's pretty affordable for home labs. Why do I use um, vSphere at home? Because I like to have an environment here in my home lab that's similar to the one I use in my company. And uh, yeah, that's why I'm using the MBV sphere. It's running on a on a Ryzen PC. It's a very uh, capable one. It has 16 physical cores and uh, 32 um, uh, with uh, multi-threading enabled. Uh, you don't need that much cores. Uh, don't be frightened of that. But I like um, to have possibilities um, to yeah to add more workers to um, play with new things. Um, one thing I tried at home is um, virtual um, OpenShift virtualization uh, based on Kubert, and this requires a little bit more horsepower um, than you normally have on your desk or on your laptop. So we have a um, um, one uh, PC for VM there this year. Um, I have another um, computer running um, an network attached storage. I'm using Truna's course, the community edition. Um, but this year, Truna's scale uh, will um, go into general availability. I like that because um, this one will have a small Kubernetes cluster running on it where you can deploy your Helm charts. And I like to have some um, components outside of my OKD cluster because I'm constantly um, deleting and creating clusters to test new things. And I, uh, yeah, I like to have um, the possibility to have some components outside of uh, my cluster. Um, yes, and on the top of the image, you see my DNS DHCP server and also the load balancer. Um, component, it's running on a Raspberry Pi. Maybe you ask yourself why I'm not running on helper VM in my 
uh, vSphere environment. I'm doing that because I also constantly uh, um, deconstructing my vSphere environment to test things. And uh, I'm also using the DNS and DHCP server for, yeah, for my home uh, environment, not only for my home lab. So I need something that's running all the time. And the Raspberry is pretty fine for that. So um, yes, and I have a DSL modem, a router that's uh, connected to the internet. And um, the first thing you should know, um, if you want to set up a DNS and DHCP server at home, you should um, be sure that no other uh, of the servers is running in your in your subnet. In my case, I had to turn off the DHCP server and the DNS server running in my in my um, DSL router before. Well, I have to say in between because for sure during the installation you need um, internet access, you need DHCP DNS server if things go wrong. Um, but um, if uh, the uh, custom built um, servers are running, you don't need see uh, yeah, servers in the Fritzbox anymore. What do you have to achieve here? Um, on the VMware vSphere um, server, there are a few VMs created during the installation process. Uh, just for your information, I use the instructions um, from uh, the GitHub repository of OKD, it's located in github.com, OpenShift OKD. There are some guides, also one for UPI vSphere. And uh, this guide, one of these guides uh, uses uh, Terraform. That's a tool that uh, can take about infrastructure, uses a domain specific language for that. And uh, there is also a Terraform provider available for vSphere. I have seven VMs, one bootstrap VM, three masters and three workers. Um, you don't need so much VMs, uh, nodes normally. I have, uh, this is my standard setup. I don't want to yeah, um, take care about um, with uh, limited uh, CPU and memory space. I wanna go and have fun. That's because it's uh, seven VMs. And the first step in the installation is that um, the Bootstrap VM starts creating a fake control plane. Um, this takes only, I think, a few minutes. It depends on how fast your internet speed is. If you have a local registry in your home labs, then things uh, can be um, um, faster because of improved um, network speeds normally have in, uh, in your home lab. The second step is that in addition to the bootstrap node, you um, have your master nodes. The master nodes are constantly um, using the load balancer that's running on the Raspberry to um, get the ignition configuration files from the bootstrap node. And if the bootstrap node is uh, in a later stage of, uh, stage of its uh, installation, it will provide with a local web server, this ignition file to all the masters that are, um, say, are um, constantly polling for that. If they get this uh, ignition files from the bootstrap VM, they are provisioning themselves, um, say, normally boot twice, a uh, boot once, sorry, um, in minimum, um, to um, boot into a new version of your operating system, a new, um, Fit or a chorus version because you start initially you start with a yeah with a um, VM template that's run that's stored in uh, vSphere and uh, beginning from this um, operating system version the VMs are running waiting for the ignition file say get it fetch a new or the say OS version that's uh, um, determined for a, a certain OKD release. They are booting into the new OS version and join the fake um, control plane that's created, um, that's running on the bootstrap node. If the control plane is running, then in the next step, the bootstrap load, um, node stops serving an ignition file. 
the load balancer will uh, see that and turn off the bootstrap communication. In this phase, you could, in theory, um, delete your bootstrap VM because you don't need it anymore. Then um, the worker VMs, they are running all the time and also um, fetching an ignition file for the workers from, at this time, the control plane that's uh, running um, with our masters. They are constantly pulling for that. And if the master control, as uh, a control plane is set up, um, again, a web server will serve the ignition file for the workers. The workers will fetch the ignition files, load the current version of uh, Fedora Chorus, boot into it, and finish the installation. And afterwards, you have a running OKD cluster. So to achieve that, um, that you have a load balancer and DNS, DHCP server, you have to set up a little bit in advance. I created um, some documentation about this process. Don't get frightened. It's uh, it's uh, lots of text. I only will sweep um, fast over that. Um, I think I used a lots of uh, standard um, documentation you can find on the internet. It's nothing special about that. I um, because I'm not using the DHCP and DNS server for the home lab, but uh, yes, for all my home environment, I turned on um, dynamic DNS. So new devices um, automatically register themselves to the DNS server. So I don't have to maintain a list uh, there um, manually. And uh, for that, I have done this. Um, maybe you have seen my description in the presentation that I have a net here. Um, it's a, um, a subnet um, a slash 24 based. I have my IP from the router. We will see it a few times. We have um, the IP address of the Raspberry Pi running the DHCP, DNS, and load balancer. I have two domains. I have my home lab net domain where everything in my, in my home is um, regist registered to. And then I have a subdomain uh, C1. It's uh, C1 means a cluster one. Um, home lab net where all my um, Kubernetes nodes, my OKD nodes are um, running inside. My, I have a DHCP range and I use a static IPs for the most important nodes um, because I, yeah, because I, I try uh, lots of installation strategies. I like to have fixed IPs for the most, um, nest, uh, for the most important uh, VMs. And for them, I use static IPs. For sure, if I create dynamic uh, nodes um, through machine sets later, um, I can use a DHCP for them. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I use a mixed scenario for that, for them. First, you have to do the usual things. I use a Raspberry Pi OS for my recipe. I update the package list. I give them a static IP. Then I install ISC DHCP server in my case. I use that for the DHCP server. I set up um, the Ethernet port configure. I do the basic uh, configuration here with this, with this file. And uh, the first section is for dynamic DNS. Um, yeah, it's not nothing special about that. I um, here this section is um, served by the DHCP server every time a new node um, requires an internet address. Your etc resolve con file will uh, be filled by parts of these options here. Here we have the definition of our subnet range of uh, sorry our DHCP range, and here are the um, the um, static IP sections where I use the MAC address that is configured by Terraform in vSphere to 
um, serves the VMs that are registering themselves or um, asking for IP addresses, um, fixed IP addresses. I do that for the bootstrap master nodes, worker nodes. And yeah, that's, that's it for the DHCP server. The next thing is uh, setting up um, the DNS server. It's a little bit, yeah, more files are involved in this because I use bind for that. I started with DNS mask, but I was not convinced um, with its features. Uh, so I, I threw it out very quickly and used bind. Um, also for that, you find lots of information in the internet and it's nothing special um, in the configuration about that, um, that I use. We have a access control list here where I say every IP from my subnet in the home lab can access the DNS server. I have, uh, yeah, I configure it also as a forwarder if a, DN if a domain name is not and known to the DNS server, it will forward its request to our, I think it's Google, the Google DNS servers in the internet. Here I turn off a few security um, switches because I had problems with that and I, yeah, I don't have the energy to find out how to make it really, really secure, but uh, um, I will improve that the next time. It's uh, a side task I gave uh, myself. Here, I define my zones. Um, I have a home lab net zone. I have the zone where OKD uh, will run its VMs. Um, it's referencing a file where I um, configure the records as um, described in the official documentation. And I have a reserve, uh, a reverse zone set up because it's uh, yeah, it's best practice. You you don't really need it for a home lab, but um, I'm using it because I, I wanted to try out how to set this up. Um, here we have a few. Yes, this is a, the zone file for my home lab. Um, in real life, uh, lots of entries are here um, because I use uh, things other than OKD um, that are using this DNS server. And this is a setup for my reverse lookup, a reverse zone uh, file. So here is now is the interesting part because here we have the zone file for C1, cluster one home lab net. And you will see, uh, yeah, lots of uh, records here. These are the records that are required by OKD to work. We have here a wildcard um, C name. That's uh, everything here is going to the load balancer. This is the internal API uh, Jamie talked about. We have an external API uh, record. Here we have the workers, the master, the bootstrap node, and the load balancer node. That's pretty much is it. The next section is um, the load balancer. It's the third and last component I have set up on my recipe. Um, HA proxy is a load balancer. I, I like it. I like it much because it is rather easy to set up. It's fast and yeah, it's, it's, yeah, don't get confused by this section. It's um, pretty much default. You have a dashboard where you can see um, which which uh, backend nodes are available or responding um, and um, which are not. We have here the load balancer for the API. Here we have a load balancer for the ignition um, configuration file server um, because maybe you remember it's the first a step is that the bootstrap node will serve the ignition files. Um, afterwards, also the master files will serve them. And if they serve the ignition files, the bootstrap node, the bootstrap node will stop serving the ignition files, and the switch over is controlled by the load balancer. 
here, we have the routes, say port 80 for HTTP um, load balancers, and it's the same for HTTPS. I have um, provided all my nodes to the load balancer because um, I like to move the um, OpenShift or OKD router around between the nodes to test things. That's why I not only have the workers in the list, but also the masters. If you reboot your node, you should check if all system D services are still running, or if there are um, errors thrown out, you can use var log um, syslog um, to find, to troubleshoot if something goes wrong. But my experience is that if you follow this guide here, it's uh, not so much as it looks like, um, then normally it should work uh, rather fast. And then in the end, you have external components, um, load balancer, DNS server, DHCP server. Um, it's a setup, I think it's rather common in, in lots of companies, I could imagine. That's why I use this and not say, yeah, easier to set up IPI um, installation method. And uh, because I want to try out things um, that I have also uh, available in my company. And that's uh, pretty much uh, everything I can tell you about that. Thank you. <laughs>